Hello citizens! In today's video I would like to cover the server mission Q&A posted last week, what it means and what questions are still left unanswered. As always, if you liked the video, sacrifice a like to the YouTube algorithm and subscribe for more. If you want to support the channel, all you need to do is keep watching or take a look at the Armory website for more ways to contribute. For me, the Q&A answered some very important questions and in this video I would like to break down most of what was covered. I know you guys like my cinematic footage as a backdrop to what I'm talking about, but today we're going to draw some diagrams to help me explain the topic as well. My most important question was how does what was presented at CitizenCon fit into what is already developed and how will the work continue? In the Q&A we learned that the first major step towards server meshing was object container streaming and server object container streaming. In simple terms, object container streaming enables both the client and the server to dynamically load and unload entities as they are needed. In Star Citizen, entities are organized into structures called object containers or simply containers, which is where the name object container streaming comes from. Containers can have different sizes, ranging from a room or a ship to an entire city. But they can also be nested, which means that, for example, when you're in your hab in Lorville, it's possible for the hab to be its own object container nested within the larger Lorville container. If needed, this also allows your client to unload the rest of Lorville while you're in your hab. It is different for the server, however. The server has to load all containers that need to be simulated, which are usually the containers that have some players in them. The other major step is entity authority, which could be considered the first true step towards server meshing. On a single server simulation, there is only one server that could possibly want to control a certain entity. An entity can be a ship or an NPC or any other element of the game. But once you scale this architecture to multiple servers simulating one instance of the verse, this poses a question of which server can control the entity. This is where entity authority comes into play. It dictates which one of the multiple servers has the authority to change the state of the entity. All other servers can only read its state. With that, you also need to have the ability to transfer authority over an entity from one server to another. This would need to happen when the entity passes from an area controlled by one server into an area controlled by another server, like when you travel from planet to planet or from system to system. Of course, this applies to static server meshing. It might work differently when dynamic server meshing comes online. So as far as we know, entity authority system is mostly complete at the moment, so what's next? The next step will be the replication layer and persistent storage. The replication layer is there to propagate state between individual server nodes and the client. It also handles streaming entities in and out of the game instance, which decreases the load on the simulation servers and also decreases their complexity by moving the required code into a separate service. What this means is that rather than having to load entities from persistent storage themselves, they will simply request the entity from the replication layer. The replication layer also handles saving entity states into the persistent storage, which is also the long-term database, which is in the form of an entity graph. So what is entity state? Entity state is all the information an entity can hold, for example location, damage state, health and many others depending on the entity. Now why is the long term database a graph? As CAG have said at CitizenCon, graphs are very efficient and computationally speaking most of their operations are pretty cheap. The long term database will be handling a huge amount of requests so it's necessary for it to be very effective in terms of performance. Graphs also create a natural hierarchy of the data, which makes some operations in the game easier. The next step will be static server meshing, where one instance of the verse will be simulated by multiple servers. In static server meshing, the number of servers per instance will be constant, and as far as I can tell, every server in the mesh will be assigned a certain area of the verse. My understanding is that servers can be assigned work based on object containers, so I imagine that for static server meshing, CIG will split the verse into very large containers and assign these to the servers in a given shard. The major advantage is that they will be able to add more star systems already, or that the designers will be able to add more complex locations since there will be more processing power available to simulate these locations. At the same time, overall server performance should improve. We will most likely see this in AI behavior improving and missions updating faster. On the other hand, a major drawback is that if players decide to gather at one location, only one of the servers in the mesh will be able to do the work, which will result in reduced performance. This problem will be solved with dynamic server meshing, where the shard will be able to decide how to best use its resources. 
For example, if a lot of players are at New Babbage, the shard might dedicate a whole server just to the New Babbage object container to ensure good simulation quality. With this, it also might be possible for a shard to request extra resources on top of what is already allocated at startup. I think now is a good time to stop and think about what CIG mean when they say shard and what does a shard contain. The way I understand it, a shard contains the mesh of simulation servers that simulate the verse and the replication layer. You could also say that a shard contains the game clients that are connected to it, but that might not be entirely true since clients can transfer between shards. So now, what is the replication layer? The replication layer sits between the shard and the long-term database. In simple terms, it provides the communication interface between the simulation servers, the long-term database and the game clients. In the original presentation, the replication layer sounded like a single point of failure, prompting a lot of people to ask what happens when it crashes. We now know that the replication layer is in fact built out of multiple services. This brings multiple advantages. Smaller services are less likely to have bugs, which decreases the likelihood of them crashing. Along with that, you can have multiple instances of that service operating within one replication layer. This means that if one of the instances crashes, the others can pick up the work until the crashed instance is restarted or replaced. Along with that, if needed, the replication layer can scale by creating more instances of the services it needs. In the Q&A, three services were mentioned. Replicant, Atlas, and Scribe. My understanding is that the Replicant facilitates replicating state across clients, simulation servers, and shards, while the Atlas and Scribe are responsible for reading and writing into the long-term database respectively. Now, the final piece of the puzzle is the gateway layer. The gateway layer is essentially a service that will be directing and routing traffic between different clients and services in the replication layer. So now that we know what a shard is, we can start thinking about how the persistent state will be shared between the shards. All entities that are currently not active in a shard are considered to be stowed into the long-term database. Once a shard unstows that entity, my understanding is that the shard has authority over that entity's state. Meaning it can change the entity's state depending on what is going on with the entity in the simulation. For example, you log into a shard, spawn your ship and load a vehicle or store some items, and then store the ship. This will cause your ship to unstow from the long-term database, modify its state in the shard, and then stow the ship back into the long-term database. We know that the long-term database stores information as a graph, so what will happen is that the graphs of the vehicle you loaded or the items you stored will be added to the graph of your ship. Now, if you log into a different shard and spawn your ship, it will unstow and appear with the items and the vehicle. So how does this concept apply to entities that don't disappear when you log out, like outposts? This process will probably be very similar. You will log into a shard and travel to your outpost. This will unstow the outpost from the long-term database and transfer authority over it to your shard. Now, since your outpost is present in the verse, it is also visible to players on other shards. So what happens when a player visits your outpost on a different shard? Well, I think this will unstow a read-only version of the outpost to show the player. Some basic services like shops and refueling might still work, but it might not be possible for the player to change anything about the outpost itself. For example, if it's your friend who has the authority to build additional buildings, they won't be able to do that. This also leads me to believe that some entities will behave differently in terms of stowing and unstowing. Because my understanding is that an entity can only be unstowed once, but permanent entities like outposts will need to be present in multiple shards at once. Now, since it's visible in multiple shards, if you make changes to your outposts like adding new buildings, these changes will need to propagate to other shards. This probably won't be instant since it requires your version of the outpost to be stowed into the long-term database and then to be unstowed in the other shards. This also brings a potential issue. If all shards besides yours have a read-only version of the outpost, in theory that makes it impossible to damage or destroy by someone in a different shard. Now, this may not sound like a problem, after all, it prevents someone from damaging your property without you being able to defend it. The actual problem is how CAG will handle this. Will the outpost be invulnerable to damage on read-only shards? Or will there be an armistice zone preventing the use of weapons? At the same time, if someone attacks this read-only version of your outpost, 
Is that still a criminal act, even though they can't damage it? However, these are questions that CAG will have to answer much later in the development than we currently are. The focus right now is to get static server meshing working and with that introduce new star systems. Ultimately, CAG seems to have designed a very robust and scalable set of services to facilitate server meshing at the level of having multiple shards. Now, their plan is to slowly scale the shards up to cover more of the verse and be able to support more players at the same time, ultimately requiring less shards with relatively the same number of simulation servers. While this is great, there's no way to know how the supporting services are going to behave in an environment where they have to scale with the simulation to a large extent. Ultimately, this should ideally lead to us having a single shard with all the players. And this creates further issues. There will be some locations of the verse where the players will gather in large numbers. It will probably be very impractical to have individual rooms or hallways in these locations be operated by individual servers. For this, CIG will have to implement some sort of layering for these locations, but that brings further issues that I don't think even CIG is ready to address yet. At the end of the day, I think that the Q&A provided a lot of insight into the CitizenCon panel but I can't help but feel that some things were left out, either intentionally or because CIG don't know yet. We will have to see what the next few months bring. So far I have the impression that the server meshing work as it was described is on schedule, so I am very hopeful that we will see it ourselves next year. With that being said, that's it for tonight. That was very likely the longest video I have ever made, and I have put a lot of my insight as a software developer into it. Please let me know if you enjoyed watching it and if you would like me to make more videos like this in the future. And of course, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already, and feel free to comment your own opinions and takeaways from the Q&A. Thank you for watching, fly safe, and I will see you in the verse.